just heard from a young politician that we shouldn't uh, remain rooted, so rooted to the past. And that's all that you do. <laughs> I'll be out of job then. <laughs> But uh, truly, um, it, it isn't just about being rooted to the past, but also reclaiming a lot of it. So let's talk about the multiple narratives that we are now looking at instead of just that one single narrative that we grew up with. And how much of it is required? And how much of it is um, in the best interests of uh, the, the country? So Kaveri, I think uh, history to me, uh, is not just a subject that you probably study in school, in colleges, mostly learn by rote, yeah. uh, memorize all these facts and then vomit it out on the paper and somehow pass the exam. Uh, as you grow older, you realize that history is that very important mirror in which we identify ourselves as a nation, as a civilization, as a people. It gives us that very important sense of self-identity. And without being rooted, uh, as Sri Aurobindo had said, earth bound, heaven amorous. Uh, you know, you have to have your roots bound very firmly and those roots come from your past. So as much as, uh, you know, we can talk about the future, which is most important, uh, unless you have a sense of where you have come from and what were the achievements, what were the mistakes, uh, I don't think a meaningful uh, road can be built for the future. And that is very important. Unfortunately, in India, as you rightly mentioned, there's been a very, very linear, simplistic, monochromatic view of a subject like this, which has multiple shades, multiple opinions. And it's been held in the uh, stranglehold of ideology, particularly, you know, how academic history uh, has been ca held captive and continues to be held captive to the ideology of what is Marxist ideology of how history as class struggle, as constant struggles between peoples uh, is how it's represented. And your thesis is that we've seen uh, uh, Indian history has been looked at as a series of failures. Yes. Rather than as a series of triumphs. So as a, as a mix of both. Let's talk a little about that. Uh, uh, why is it so important to correct that perspective? And sometimes you can go overboard there, yes. right? No, there's a very, very thin line between, uh, you know, jingoism and uh, Mera Bharat Maha and everything about the past is yeah. great. We had all the we best had everything. things. everything. We yeah, knew yeah, it all. Yeah. Then there's nothing for us to work for in the yeah. future. But then the opposite, which is what I think has been dinned into our heads, particularly through the narrative of history, is this entire sense of self-loathing, looking at only the negatives. Now, every society has positives and negatives, but we overemphasize so much on the negative aspects of our society and our failures that that almost makes us feel, as I said, a sense of inferiority, a sense of self-loathing. It's not a historian's job to whip up jingoism or uh, pride or whatever. We have but enough it, politicians. Yeah, we have enough of them to yes. do that. But then at the same time, this is also not something that uh, is the role of a historian. And as uh, Nigerian author Chinua Achebe had yeah. said, that until the lions find their storytellers, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunters. Uh, and in the case of India, I think for the longest time, it's been the hunters who've been writing our history. So Indian history is seen as the history of invaders. Now, even in our history textbooks while we were growing up, we would all know the genealogy of the Khiljis, the Lodhis, the Tughlaqs, whose contribution, I think, to this land or the civilization was next to Zilch. But then large parts of India, uh, the south of India, uh, where this is held, the, the Cholas, I think till Ponni and Selvan came, I don't know how many of the rest of India even knew much about the Cholas or could name two Chola kings other than Raja Raja and Raja Indra Chola who ruled for thousands of years. Uh, similarly, the Rashtrakutas, the Pallavas, the Shatavahanas, the Gangas, the Kadambas, the Vodayars of Mysore, the rulers of Travancore, very, very, uh, you know, uh, enlightened royal houses uh, don't even feature in this larger narrative that we call the history of India. The Northeast, I don't know if uh, people in this room can name two no uh, Ahom rulers from Assam. Uh, the Ahoms ruled for 600 long years, but how much of their story forms a part of the history of Bharat? So if you say history of India, it is certainly not just the history of Delhi. 
which unfortunately has become this highly Delhi centric narrative, whether it's in the media, whether it's in mainstream narratives or even in the telling of our history. And I think Bharat needs to snatch back her story from Delhi. And that's what is a reclamation of history. But do you think uh, it is, it has always been presented as a conspiracy? Do you think it was a conspiracy or was it, was it sheer, care, care, sheer carelessness? I mean, how could it be carelessness when you ignore vast parts of your own country, even while there are sources? For instance, you know, uh, they say Indians don't have a sense of history yeah. writing, but then Kashmir, for instance, uh, you're from there and Kalhana and the Raja Tarangini documents 500, 600 years of the entire pre-Islamic rule of Kashmir. The Cholas left multiple accounts of their times, uh, the same information in triplicate sometimes, you know, on temple walls, on palm, palm leaves, leaves. <laughs> coins, in multiple languages, in Tamil as well as in Sanskrit, uh, so that if one is destroyed, another holds. The Assamese have documented their history right from the 4th century BCE, and the Ahom rule right from 1228 or so, is very well documented in documents known as the Burunjis. So all these have been very much part of, it's been extant, but people just didn't look at it. And this narrative Kaveri of uh, defeatism, I think that also comes from where uh, the, the colonial masters left us, uh, where that myth was created. It's a bogus today and it's been uh, proved as much, the Aryan invasion, uh, where the idea that was told to us was right from your earliest inhabitants. You have always been ruled by people from outside. You don't have the capacity to rule yourself. You need people from the outside to come and give you culture, education, everything that's good about yourself. And so we, the British, the East India Company is just one in this long list of outsiders who have come and uh, colonized you. Uh, but then, you know, if we are still around as a civilization, the only pre-Bronze Age era civilization which is alive and kicking, uh, we did, you know, also- you Must have done something right. Done something right, put some, uh, you know, resistance and courage. But you, but you also so, read, don't you, that Aurangzeb could never go beyond the Vindyas. I mean, the Deccan was always something that, I mean, he wasn't able to conquer. So you do read that, but you don't, of course, read more than that. Yeah. It stops there. But there is that sense that the education system has to build that curiosity. We've just been talking about curiosity. It has to build that curiosity in you to know why, right? And nobody asks why. And the teacher, if you ask her or him why, will say it's not in the syllabus, right? <laughs> well, at least, at least curiosity when it comes to history. I don't know. There are a lot of young people here. How many of them have been curious to know history after school? I think they, they all must have just been waiting to get rid of the subject even while they were studying. Unfortunately. Because, uh, you know, as I said, the rote learning, yeah. the memorizing facts. So beyond that, it, it has been made into such e a dull Even and drab the categorization of ancient, medieval, modern. Yeah. I mean, these are ridiculous uh, and, distinctions. And this whole thing about regional stories. If you actually go to the NCRT website. No, vernacular. Vernacular. Regional. What is regional? Uh, regional are the Cholas us? regional powers yeah. or are they national? So no, only they're, they're actually international. <laughs> yes, exactly. They went beyond uh, the borders of yeah. what is today India to Sri Lanka to Maldives to Sri Vijaya. We, we need Mani Ratnam to tell us that. Why Which is can, unfortunate. Wh uh, why can't we have... So when you see the new education policy, for instance, does it address all this? It's, it's great in intent, Kaveri. I don't know. The proof of the pudding is finally in eating it because I don't think the, the new textbooks and so on or the new content, as much as one berates this government, uh, its pro uh, op opponents for not, uh, for changing and saffronizing and all of that, its supporters actually berate it for not doing enough hmm. because in nine years, it doesn't take rocket science to change books. How long uh, does it take to write yeah, a textbook? Yeah. I guess a year. Less than that, perhaps. Uh, mm. You just need to find the appropriate experts to sit in a room and those who come from all over India right. and who bring in perspectives from every part of India. But then that doesn't happen. So uh, uh, it's nice, the education policy in the way it is uh, conceptualized. But then the proof of the pudding should be once the books come out, do they actually capture that spirit that is encapsulated in the policy? 
Are they being written? Do you know? I have no clue because right. I have no insight or uh, this thing into the government or what it, how so, it works. So we have to read your books to know what happened uh, uh, beyond the Mughals and beyond East India Company. That will be a lot, lot of self-plugging. I wouldn't <laughs> want to say only my books, but I'm sure there are lots of others who are writing these days, which is important. Uh, and on every aspect, even on the freedom movement, uh, you know, for the longest time we've uh, heard of the freedom movement almost like this very, very simplistic, linear, almost cut to cut, frame to frame Attenborough film. De di hame azadi bina khadg bina dhal, sabarmati ke sant tune kar diya kamal and so on. Where but we've also had the legend of Bhagat Singh. Maybe he didn't win Oscars, but Bhagat Singh is as much a hero. But unfortunately, Kaveri, even today in the Delhi University textbooks, Bhagat Singh, Bhaga Jatin, uh, all of them are called as revolutionary terrorists. Uh, you know, that's the term used for them. Uh, in fact, in 2016, the uh, descendants of Bhagat Singh had written to the then HRD minister, uh, Mrs. Smriti Rani, uh, that this was a term that the, the colonizers British, yeah. gave our ancestors. They have someone who sacrificed their life. And today, so many decades after independence, the textbook is conveying to the young mind that people like this are terrorists. What is the connotation of that term? How loaded is that? Did they change it by the way? I have no clue. Uh, that needs to be checked. But uh, the thing is, yes, so this constant, uh, you know, right from 1857, which was the first war, war of, of independence. Indi indi independence. But we are always told that it was the mutiny. It was the mutiny, which incidentally, Savarkar was someone who recoined as the first war. We'll come to Savarkar your hero later. <laughs> to 1946, which saw, unfortunately, we use the same term, naval mutiny, yeah. while it should be the last war of Indian exactly. independence, which was uh, in push. Mumbai. Yeah. Um, and it spread across various army and naval uh, units across India, the heroics of I, uh, the Indian National Army and Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, there's been an unending chain of armed resistance, which is what ultimately got India her freedom. Uh, but then that is really not, uh, you know, spoken about or shown in the manner or commensurate importance that it deserves. Uh, it is not my case to disparage anybody or to, to to undermine the non-violent movement or anything. But then the converse is also not acceptable, where the sacrifices of so many who have actually contributed through this violent means, and laton ke bhoot baaton se nahi mante, every time there was a very, uh, you know, bloody revolution, that was when the British gave in, uh, and reforms came in, whether it was the Morley Minto reforms, the Montagu Chensford, the Government of India Act, or finally independence. All these reforms were preceded by terrible, you know, bloody acts of uh, revolution and the British were petrified. They did not want a repeat of 1857 and the carnage that was there in the army. So the Congress too was created as a safety wall to ensure that this repeat does not happen. Uh, so I think these aspects of our freedom struggle to forget ancient history, medieval India and all of that. Even something as recent as this, we do not uh, talk about in a holistic manner. Don't undermine anyone's importance, don't take away, in my own state in Karnataka, there's been a lot of talk by the government there that Tipu Sultan's name should not be featured, which I think is a very foolish thing to say and do because, you know, you can't wish away your history, whether you like a person or not, that person has a role in, uh, in annals of history. So the good, the bad, the ugly of anybody needs to be shown to the young mind and it's for them to make up their minds. So don't undermine, don't censor anything, but then make it more holistic, make all regions of India included. The many histories as this session is titled, I think you call it a history of India, you know, all these narratives, all these stories need to find a legitimate place. So that's why the work of uh, the work that you're doing and people like you are doing is important. But then there is this other argument that, oh, your sources are perhaps not as uh, kosher as, uh, you know, they should be. And there's pseudo history happening and there's uh, all this. So there is the pushback from uh, the conventional establishment, uh, establishment which um, uh, continues. So what's your uh, uh, defense against that or what's your argument against that? Well, I don't want to be defensive at all because <laughs> I think it's expected. You said uh, establishment, conventional. So someone who's ruled the fort for so long, yeah. obviously if someone is coming from the outside and throwing rockets and puncturing their claims, which is happening now increasingly, uh, there is going to be pushback. 
But then, as someone said, uh, you know, history is too important to be left only to the historians. historians. Uh, in this case, maybe academic historians. Uh, there are lots of us who have chosen not to be in the university setup. I have a PhD in history. I've trained, uh, you know, in the discipline. But then still, that is not good enough. So this constant uh, derision of people who come from the outside and this dog in the manger attitude that some of them have that, you know, uh, only I have the key to knowledge and nobody else can. And they are the same ones who talk about Brahminical uh, patriarchy and so on and so forth. Whereas this is something like that. You're holding on to your turf uh, without allowing any, any alternate voices to flourish. Whereas a, a, a discipline like history thrives on multiplicity of voices, on dissent, on discussion, on debate and differences of opinion. But in the decades following independence, unfortunately, at least in the academic arena, I, as I said earlier, the stranglehold of ideology and one kind of group uh, has been so bad that, you know, careers have been destroyed. Yeah, that uh, is true. Careers have been destroyed in academia. People have not had a voice. And this whole thing of pseudo history, some mythical paycheck, which is supposedly coming from somewhere. I'm really curious to know where that money is coming from, if at all it is, and who is sponsoring that. Uh, so all these, when you don't have an argument, uh, personal attacks, allegations, these become uh, the, 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 the main defense. Uh, how, who determines what is a correct source? Uh, who actually, uh, you know, sits in judgment of all of this? Uh, so I think that needs to and be assessed. And who decides uh, that the court poet in one case, his history is fine, but... Uh, the court poet in another case yeah. is perhaps just exaggerating, right? Yes. That often happens. Correct, correct. And even there, you know, I mean, I'll just give one example of how distortion can happen. Uh, we are told time and again that, uh, you know, when the, uh, the, the Jyotirling of Somnath was attacked by Mahmud of Ghazni, it was not done for theological purposes. It was more economic. There was a lot of wealth and the you know, cunning Brahmins had cheated everybody that stored so much of wealth there and that's why he came and looted it. But you go to the chroniclers of, uh, you know, Muhammad Ghazni himself, his own time and also later people like Farishta, Al-Baruni, Minhaj Siraj, all these people. And what do they say? They are all unanimous in the manner in which, first of all, when Muhammad came there, he saw about 50,000 common Hindus who were defending the temple. These were not even uh, members of the Chalukyan army because the king had run away and there was no one to defend. It was common Hindus who were defending that place. It took him three days to kill all of them. And then when he entered the sanctum and wanted to demolish uh, the, the shivling, uh, the priests come there and say, you are a lutera, you want money, so we'll give you as much money as you want. You please take that and leave. And Muhammad is supposed, and these chroniclers themselves say, he laughs and says, if I do that, I will be called as a trader of idols, whereas I would like my legacy to be remembered as a butch shikan or as a breaker of idols. And so he refuses the money, demolishes the shivling, and then it is pounded into pieces and taken back to Ghazni and made as steps the step, to the yeah. masjids there so that every time the faithful steps on it, the religion of the infidel comes down. Now, this is a fact of history. Uh, now, this too is whitewashed. Only because somehow we feel talking about these uncomfortable truths of the past is going to upset today's contemporary uh, social harmony, uh, which is, Vikram, which is that, extremely that, foolish. But Vikram, you must understand that that was, of course, at that period. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly. We, we nobody were, nobody we were, in the. We in had just emerged from perhaps the worst bloodbath uh, uh, possible with the partition. partition. Yes. So that was the time then. It, so, it should have ideally, therefore, Kaveri yeah. have been, since we had emerged out of a bloodbath, yeah. we should have told our communities then that your heroes and icons are not these barbarians and invaders. Dehyphenating today's communities uh, from all these invaders of the past, a Muslim, young Muslim man or woman today is not responsible for what Ghazni and Ghori and Aurangzeb and Tipu and all these people did. But at the same time, 
why do you have to whitewash the crimes of all these characters to make them palatable to today's people and for them to get some strange sense of security of living in this country? That's you, you talking. You have to dehyphenate. Yeah. yeah, but you have to dehyphenate today's communities from all these invaders and say they are not your icons, even if you want icons of the same religion, which again I find it very problematic. A uh, Hindu can have a Muslim or a yeah, Christian yeah, or anybody course. as your. But even if you want someone of your own faith, you have enough syncretic examples from Rahim to Ras Khan to Dara Shiko rather than Aurangzeb and uh, Sant Shishunal Sharif from Karnataka, APJ Abdul Kalam to Arif Mohammed Khan, the long list of other people. So why do you want to do this subterfuge of whitewashing the crimes of these people and thereby creating concocted history? The edifice of national unity cannot rest on the shaky foundations of fabricated history. It is going to come crashing down because light is the best disinfectant. Once the facts are there, you know, you may say all this in your textbook, but you take your child to Hampi and show them the magnificent ruins. And a child is going to ask who broke this beautiful uh, temple or go to Konark, go anywhere else. What is a parent supposed to answer? The school textbook is going to say something else, uh, but the child is going to have a different question. So why can't we make peace with our past? Why can't we tell the truth as it is, without fear or favor of it hurting anybody or what, whatever? That is you, Vikram. When in, in your hands, there's nuance. In the hands of the politicians, there's no nuance, and you know that. But in the hands of the politicians, it becomes us versus them. Yes, Kaveri, but then politicians can do whatever they want. I mean, nothing will prevent them from doing 24 by 7 politics because there's a next election that is to be won. But is a historian a chef that, a, <laughs> that you know, the ruler is going to say, I, you know, thoda namak kam karo, reduce the salt, reduce the, uh, this one, and accordingly he will cook the meal and serve? Or is the historian's work to show things as they are? Or, uh, they, or is the historian a taster? <laughs> No, I think he's just a truth seeker <laughs> who just, I think a historian's role is to illuminate the archives, illuminate the facts and bring it out as it is, as unpalatable, whatever conflicts there are between whichever communities, talk about it. We've been a wounded civilization, so let's, uh, let's not brush it under the carpet. Uh, I think our civilization needs healing and we need to talk about it, have that truth and reconciliation Ubuntu, as it happened in South Africa, you know, where the, you say, sorry, but who will you heal. say sorry to? No, it's an intergenerational trauma. Yeah. I mean, it in Ubuntu, the victim and the perpetrator were perhaps alive and they could look yeah. at each other in what the eye. What will you do here? I mean, just not uh, denying these, uh, these uh, you know, problems, not even say that there was a genocide uh, over so many uh, centuries, not even talk about the atrocities. Uh, I think that is uh, adding insult to injury because you don't even uh, acknowledge uh, that these things happened. Where is retribution? Where is justice? Nobody even is going that far. So once you don't do that, once you don't heal from the past, I think these, uh, you know, dragons will keep coming out from under the carpet. More you push them under, the more they will resurface. And we are seeing social tensions. We are seeing what's happening uh, all the time it. because no, of there's that. so much rage. Yeah. And this rage finds uh, uh, a direction sometimes with arguments like this. And then it's out of your control, right? Rage what against do do? what? Against the other. What else? The, who is the other? Here it's a politician. Uh, no. so, <laughs> and I think it's good to have rage against a politician. No, no, it's and not the politician. The <laughs> it's, it's different communities who at some point or the other... Uh, you know, were perhaps ruling us or invaded or whatever. So there again, we, we're doing the same mistake, Kaveri, where we're saying, is a particular community today, is a Muslim boy or girl answerable for what Muhammad Ghazni did? Why should that be? Uh, when we talk of the atrocities of the East India Company and what they did, no we one don't ever say... attacks the Brits. No, no, we, we, we talk openly about what all happened, the loot, the Bengal famine, the British Raj and how it was. Dr. Tharoor has written an entire book on that, The Inglorious Empire. Uh, and it's been called Nazis with better PR. <laughs> <laughs> but then at that 
that time no one thinks this is going to upset the Christians of India. Uh, there the religion and the atrocity is not clubbed together. But why is it only here that we don't need, want to talk about it? Uh, it is not for calling for, uh, you know, revenge stories or, or whatever. Uh, history is nuanced, but at the same time, it has been a handmaiden of the politician. Uh, it is inevitable that, uh, you know, people are going to weaponize it and use it either way. Hmm. Uh, both sides, left, right, whichever, uh, you know, group is, uh, you know, using that history. But that sh shouldn't prevent those of us, largely in this room, none, very few of us are politicians, we're all... Uh, educators, academics, uh, people from uh, the media who are knowledge seekers. Uh, do we hold our knowledge, uh, uh, you know, captive to the constraints of politics uh, and what politicians might do and therefore not say uh, what is honest and what is truthful? That is something that needs to be addressed. Let's talk about the other silences. You've talked about so many of the silences which you've broken. You've talked about this uh, in your new book. You've talked about the other uh, so-called subaltern rulers mm -hmm. who never actually featured in uh, our textbooks. What are the other silences that worry you? For instance, the contribution of India to the First World War or the right. Second World War. There are so many, many gaps in our history which we don't address. I mean, where does, where does one start? Where does one stop? That's a good question. I think we have such a long and, you know, vast the, history. The list is endless. Yeah. So even in this latest book of mine called Brave Hearts yeah. of Bharat, uh, where I'd listed 15, only 15 people, a lot of people said, why 15 and so on? There should be more. Obviously, there are hundreds of unsung heroes and heroines from different parts of India. And these are stories which uh, deserve to be told. Now, there was someone called Lachit Barphokan uh, from Assam, uh, a home gen general, uh, who in the Battle of Sarai Ghat uh, in 1671 ensured that the Mughal army of Aurangzeb was completely devastated and sent back. And Assam has been an invincible, uh, you know, uh, area uh, right from the early uh, centuries till till the recent times, till the 1850s when it finally got occupied. Whether it was the Afghans, whether it was the Mughals, whether it was the Burmese, uh, they could not capture Assam. And probably that's why Assam's story doesn't get featured yeah. because we don't want to know stories of uh, resilience. What happened? Resilience, exactly. of pushback, of success in that resilience too. Uh, and recently, I think, Lachit's 400th birth yeah. anniversary was celebrated with a lot of band baja in Thank Delhi. Himanta Biswasan. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, till then, no one even knew this man even existed. In neighboring Kerala, you have the, uh, you have someone like Martha and Varma, uh, who in the Battle of Kolachal in 1741 ensured that the Dutch East India Company was completely devastated. Now, the Dutch by then, you know, had a, it was one of the first companies to be listed on the global stock exchanges. Uh, it had a sphere of access which went from South Africa going all the way up to Asia. But they uh, never recovered Asia. from that. Yes. Asia, going up to Japan and Maldives. And but for the Battle of Kolachal, I think we'd be having this conversation in Dutch. Exactly. Uh, because we'd have been colonized by them. But, uh, you know, he ensured that in that Battle of Kolachal, uh, this man was defeated. Uh, the Dutch were defeated. In any other country, you would have had the statues of Martha and Varma in, you know, street squares. And the Battle of Kolachal would be something that people would feel very justifiably proud of. Uh, what is wrong? That's not a jingoism. These are uh, places where your ancestors have won. But even that, we somehow downplayed. And outside Kerala, I don't know how many people really know Martha and Varma. I don't remember reading about him in my growing up years. Yeah, but popular culture, folk stories, those keep these alive, thankfully. But then how yeah. much of it do we know outside, as that you said? Is, that is true. And yeah. that's only very local again. Yeah. Uh, you know, how, how much does... Uh, uh, a child in Tamil Nadu know about Lalita Ditya Mukta Pida of Kashmir exactly. and vice versa how many children in Himachal or uh, Kashmir know about Lalita Ditya or Rani Abbakka from uh, Karnataka who defeated the Portuguese yes. uh, so and, or Velu Nachiar from Tamil Nadu who was the first woman who led a very valiant attack against the East India Company and also regained her principality of Shivaganga uh, but I don't think even in neighboring Karnataka, people know much about Velu Nachiar. Uh, so I think that is the problem uh, where, uh, you know, uh, as I said, it's a very, very thin line between jingoism, between reclamation of what is something that you can be genuinely proud of, 
uh, about your own past and the achievements of your ancestors. Yes. Uh, thank you for introducing Rani Naiki Devi in my life because uh, all through the years I have been reading of Mohammad Ghori, but uh, Rani Naiki Devi never comes into the picture. And uh, regarding the secularizing the history, what do you think are the dangers in secularizing the history? And just because it is not uh, mentioned in the school textbooks, we comfortably try to ignore and we have a stereotypical view about uh, the Indic view or the uh, revisioning the history. How do we overcome that modern, secular, liberal thoughts? Yeah, yeah which is the sad part. I mean, a, a modern, secular, liberal should not be a cuss word. It should actually be something that we should celebrate. But unfortunately, in, in India, that's become almost like to say I'm modern and liberal and secular is uh, something that you need to be ashamed of. I I would consider I'm very modern. I'm very liberal. I'm very secular. You were but very at the same liberal time, until you wrote, uh, when you wrote Gohar Jan's biography. Yeah, but then, then, you, then you were not liberal when you wrote uh, Savarkar. Savarkar. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is a very warped uh, idea itself of what this uh, these terms mean, and I'm 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 uh, very grateful to you that you uh, you know uh, remembered Nike Devi as for those who might not know she was a Chalukyan queen who actually defeated Mohammad Ghori uh, in the Battle of Kasarhada in 1178. Ghori was so badly defeated that he did not even he was so humiliated that a woman had defeated him, that he didn't even turn towards Gujarat again. Uh, but again, she would not feature in the larger narrative. I think what you spoke about, uh, to say that if you talk about the Indic narrative, you are somehow regressive, you are somehow a bigot, uh, I think that needs to go. Uh, there are a lot of us who hold, uh, who hold all those values of being liberal and so on. But at the same time, that same Sri Aurobindo's verse of earth bound, and heaven amorous, heaven. Uh, you know, we, we take pride in what our, uh, you know, past is and in our, in the Indic nature of this nation. This gentleman, otherwise he's getting very angry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sir, I should have asked this question to thank you, I can hold it. To Aditya Thakare, we understand that history's narrative has got changed. But this is a case in which 1966, his grandfather, the most brilliant Marathi whom I know, Balsa Thakare, started a party called Shiva Sena, which is clearly based on Shivaji, Chhatrapati Shivaji, 400 year old history. And two generations later, the grandson is disowning history. I thought of asking this question to the grandson himself. My hand was equally raised. Uh, I very uh, missed my hand, yeah. <laughs> so I'm so asking sorry. you, sir, why are people forgetting what their own grandfather did? Oh my God. <laughs> 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 I he has to, to go back it. to Bombay at some point, no? <laughs> yeah, that is true. No, yeah, I think that, that's that's yeah. where I think political considerations of today ensure that you forget uh, some of the uh, things that your own ancestors have come up with. Yeah, that, that lady and then I'm sorry, we'll have to call it a day. But I'm glad a girl, because another aspect that I've tried to balance is ah, the, the story women. of women. Yeah. Uh, you know, women have an equal contribution in our history and yes. they... History is always his story, where her story doesn't get the importance. <laughs> Vikram yes. is full of such wonderful uh, uh, aphorisms and wonderful <laughs> statements. You'll have to keep clapping. Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Nandini. Uh, I'm not sure if you might be the right person to ask this question to, but since you said that... Um, as long as it's not about Shiv Sena and Mr. Thakre, I mean, Yeah, I mean, sure. But the so, DMK. Uh, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> since you said that a Muslim girl or boy cannot be, you know, blamed for something that uh, the Mughals did, um, don't, I'd like to know your opinion on this. Uh, don't you think that uh, it's wrong that, you know, uh, certain castes are being denied reservation for something that their ancestors have done? True. Good point. True. It's a very, very valid point and the converse is also true. All those people who keep saying, let's... <laughs> Let's not demonize communities. Let's not demonize uh, anybody. Uh, the 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 Brahmin caste is the uh, is the very very favorite whipping boy even now. Uh, you know every day in and day out. There it's okay to demonize. There it's okay to uh, call names, including in uh, uh, Tamil Nadu, where the entire politics uh, revolves around anti-Brahminism. You have to uh, leave the city. Leave very quickly. <laughs> So, yeah, those are one among numerous hypocrisies, double standards, uh, which keep happening. The, the, the mythical conquest between Hindus and Buddhists, which is sought to be created, again, by eminent historians who, when asked, uh, called upon to show evidence for that. 
no, there would be conflict in this long uh, civilization in so many thousands of years. Uh, people would fight. Some Pushyamitra Shunga, one or two examples like this. Was it a stated policy of, first of all, you say there's nothing called Hindu. Then you say Hindu rulers actually uh, demonize the Buddhists uh, and destroyed. Even Nalanda, there is this alternate theory. We know from Bhaktiar Kilji's own uh, accounts, uh, and Professor Sunena Singh is here from the Nalanda University. The Nalanda University, uh, when Bhaktiar Kilji uh, you know, ransacked it, uh, as accounted by his own chroniclers, as I mentioned yeah. earlier, it burned for six months. Six months. Uh, the number of manuscripts, uh, which you know, the amount of knowledge of this country which was destroyed, uh, was there, and they gloated over it. Their chroniclers actually praised the Sultan for doing what they did. But you have apologists today in the name of eminent historians who will say actually it was a Brahmin Buddhist conflict which is what caused Nalanda's uh, you know destruction. How much will you stretch uh, you know the perversity of uh, whitewashing history and that is pseudo history. Where is the source? There you don't know. So you create all these conflicts. Uh, then it is okay to not to demonize uh, an entire religion or caste as the young lady asked, but then here if you even talk about it and constantly say de-hyphenate, don't make them, uh, you know, identify with this. For national unity today, you, that is actually a bigger importance. You need to tell people today that they don't idolize all these people. And this is not happening in some Delhi Sultanate time. What happened in, uh, what is happening in Afghanistan? Uh, right from the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas to the way the women are treated today uh, under the Taliban. Uh, I don't know how different the Delhi Sultanate was, uh, you know, so it's Delhi Sultanate in action in our vicinity. So the, the problems of it happening again and again is very much rife. So for our own national security, national integration, social cohesion, you actually need to tell the truth and tell people don't identify with this, don't idolize this, don't be apologists for someone like this. Here's to more truths. Thank you so much, uh, thank Victor, you. and thank you for the audience as well. Thank you.